well, we're going to be starting Chapter 8, and for the rest of the semester, we're going to be talking about Chapter 8, and it covers valvular heart diseases. So we're going to talk about them in general, and then we're going to talk about them individually. So I actually think now is when we're really getting into echo, so I'm actually kind of excited for you guys. So when we talk about valvular heart diseases, you have your normal valve, and then you have your abnormal valves. Now, these valves can be stenotic or regurgitant valves. So when we talk about valvular heart disease, it can be acquired, it can be congenital, and um, over time, the incidence have decreased in which we see these happening. But the reason why is because um, of technological advancements and antibiotics. So when the valve is normal, it opens and closes properly so the blood is able to flow the way it needs to flow. And the pressure on either side of the valve is equal most of the time, so there's no issue. Now, the flow is going to always travel from higher pressure to lower pressure. And so it moves from chamber to chamber without an issue. The flow is either going to be laminar or parabolic. Remember, laminar is slow, steady flow. And parabolic is when the flow takes on that bullet shape where the flow in the middle is traveling the fastest and the flow that's like traveling against the walls is a little bit slower. When we have valvular heart disease, though, it creates a type of chaos. So we lose that laminar flow and then we start having areas of turbulence. That's where there's roughness and um, the flow is not steady. So if the person has stenosis, what's going to happen is they're going to have what we call pressure overload. If they have regurgitation, they're going to have what we call volume overload. So when you have regurgitation, what happens is you have volume overload. So the blood that's coming in um, leaves, but then it comes right back. And because the blood is still coming in while the other one is returning, the chamber is going to enlarge. It's not going to thicken. It's just going to enlarge to kind of accommodate for that extra blood. So you're having volume overload. When you have stenosis, however, the valve is not opening properly. So the blood that's leaving has to fight to leave. So the heart is going to get thicker and the um, the reason why um, the blood is not leaving is because the valves themselves are thickened and they're not opening and they're not easily pliable. So over time, you're going to have pressure overload. So the pressure is there's pressure building because blood is coming in here, but it can't leave. While it's over here, the blood is coming in, it's leaving, but it's some of it is returning back. So volume overload for blood that returns back to where it came from pressure overload for blood that's not able to leave the way it's supposed to. So in echo, this is what we're going to see. If you have tricuspid stenosis, this is the baseline right here. One and two are showing mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis. But in real echo, one, which represents mitral stenosis, looks like this. It still looks like an M. It's just the flow is going to have high velocity. Tricuspid stenosis is still going to kind of look like an M. It doesn't quite look like this right here. But what I want you to take away from this, tricuspid stenosis and mitral stenosis are going to be above the baseline, the flow for them. So this is what tricuspid stenosis looks like, the flow above the baseline. And this is what mitral stenosis looks like, the flow above the baseline. Tricuspid regurgitation and mitral regurgitation are below the baseline. This is what mitral regurgitation looks like. And this is what tricuspid regurgitation looks like. Now, you also have um, aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. This is what aortic stenosis looks like. It'll appear below the baseline. That's what they're showing you here. And aortic regurgitation will appear above the baseline. That's what they're showing you here. Now, pulmonic uh, stenosis will be below the baseline. That's what they're showing you here. Pulmonic regurgitation or pulmonic insufficiency, as it's sometimes called, will show up above the baseline. So that's what they're showing you here. I need you to notice something. The mitral stenosis, which is right here, and the mitral regurgitation, 
they're going to have a higher velocity than the tricuspid stenosis and the tricuspid regurgitation. Likewise, the aortic stenosis and the aortic insufficiency or regurgitation is going to have higher velocities than the pulmonic stenosis and the pulmonic regurgitation. It's all you need to remember. When a person has stenosis, you define that as a narrowing or thickening or fusion or any type of blockage of a valve that stops the blood from flowing the way it's supposed to. So the valve itself that has the issue is going to be affected in three different areas. It's going to be affected proximally, it's going to be affected at the level of its actual stenosis, and it's going to be affected distally. So the proximal part of the stenosis, you're going to have the blood backing up and the pressure is going to build up. So eventually, if we're dealing with like aortic stenosis, the person would have ventricular hypertrophy because the heart is going to be trying very hard to pump out the blood, but because the valve is not opening, it's going to have to like get stronger. So the muscle is going to thicken. Now, if you have mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis, I'm sorry, what's going to happen is the atria is going to get larger. The reason why the atria is going to get larger, because remember, the blood is still coming from the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. Unfortunately, the mitral valve isn't opening properly to let the blood out. So because of this reason, what's happening is the atria is going to get larger. This is all proximally to the stenosis. Now, at the actual level of the stenosis, what you're going to notice is there's going to be like um, diastolic doming of the actual valve itself, because it's not opening, but the blood is pressing against it, trying to get it to open. So you're going to have that doming effect. And the valve area, that's how well the valve open, is going to decrease because it's stenotic and most likely calcified. Right past the stenosis, aka distal, the flow is going to be turbulent and disturbed because the blood that's getting out is going to like do a little swirly thing once it gets to a space where there's actually more room for it. And you're going to have a pressure decrease in that area. But there's a uh, two main things you need to understand, preload and afterload. So preload is the initial stretching of the cardiac muscles before it contracts. And so it's related to ventricular filling. Afterload is the force of the load against which the heart has to contract in order to eject the blood. So remember that afterload is the pressure against which the heart must work to eject that blood during systole. The lower the afterload, the more blood the heart will be able to eject every time it squeezes. So um, that's something to keep in mind. All right, you guys, so when we do echo for stenosis, we do a transthoracic echocardiogram right away because, number one, it's non-invasive and it gives the doctor a lot of information. So a few things we have to assess and there's a few things we have to put on the report. The first thing is we need to get their height, their weight, their body surface area, blood pressure, heart rate, and rhythm. You may not need to do all of this. The nurse may do some of these. Um, anatomic information we need to get we need to talk about the actual stenotic valve, the number of cusps it has, the leaflets, how thick they are, how mobile they are. Are they calcified? Is there that diastolic doming? Do we have any fusion of them? Any other information that we can give to help the doctor give a, a compound diagnosis? Um, we also want to talk about the chamber in general, as in uh, the chamber that the valve is attached to. How is it functioning? Is it enlarged? How thick are the walls? Um, we also want to use color Doppler to get the hemodynamic assessments. Do they have regurgitation along with the stenosis? Do they have normal rhythms or do they have um, abnormal rhythms? If they have a normal rhythm, we want an average of three beats. If they have an irregular heart rhythm, like AFib, we want an average of five beats for, so the doctor can, you know, do an accurate job. So for the mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis, we will measure pressure half time, we'll measure the valve area, and we will get the mean pressure gradient. For aortic stenosis and pulmonic stenosis, we'll get the peak velocity, the valve area, the mean pressure gradient, and the maximum pressure gradient. Page 168 does a good job of talking about this. It's not just stenosis that we worry about. Sometimes we worry about regurgitation.
So when we talk about regurgitation, is the valve is opening fine on like stenosis, but what's happening is it's not closing properly. So the regurgitant jet is going to travel from the chamber that the uh, blood went into back through the defective valve and back to the chamber that it just came from. Wherever the blood is going is called the distal chamber. Where it's coming from, it's called the proximal chamber. And there's a very uh, like there's a variety of things that could cause the valve to not close properly. So when you have primary regurgitation, it means that structural changes to the valve itself, like it degenerates over time because of inflammation, infection, any type of trauma like a car accident. Maybe sometimes the person is born with it or any type of bad response to medical treatment can cause primary regurgitation. Functional regurgitation is usually because of the chamber itself. Let's say the chamber got enlarged because of something else that's going to lead to the valve not closing properly. So that's the difference between the two. Now in echo, you would use color Doppler most of the time to check the regurgitation. Now remember, we're still getting all the stuff right here that I talked about earlier, but there's three main things we're going to add to that. Especially for the mitral valve, you need flow convergence, the vena contracta, and the regurgitant jet area. Uh, we need to check the regurgitant jet characteristics, like is it an eccentric jet? Is it a central jet? Which direction is it moving? We will use continuous wave Doppler um, to also measure it. And also we look at how the wave is going and how the flow is actually moving. Um, do we have any type of flow reversal? Like, is it bad? Like the pulmonary veins, if you ever notice flow in the pulmonary veins, back up a flow, it means the person has severe mitral regurgitation. Um, for aortic regurgitation and pulmonic regurgitation, we need the pressure half time. And we will use co uh, continuous wave Doppler uh, to check the filling patterns for both mitral regurgitation and tricuspid regurgitation. And we would need the right ventricular systolic pressure and the systolic pulmonary arterial pressure for tricuspid regurgitation. Don't worry about that right now. We will talk about that more in depth when we specifically talk about tricuspid regurgitation. So for when we're talking about the regurgitant valve, we need to report, is it thick? Is it calcified? Is it do you have a dilated annulus? Are the valves opening and closing properly or what we call coaptation? Do they have mitral valve prolapse? Do they have flail mitral valve? Do they have any type of tenting of the aortic valves? Um, is there vegetations? And just any other thing that you can think of that would help the doctor. Remember just now I talked about flow convergence, vena contractor, and regurgitant area? Well, let's talk about what those are. So in mitral regurgitation, you're going to turn on color Doppler, and you're going to get something that looks like this. So Right here says flow convergence. What that zone is, it's the zone of increased flow velocity right before the regurgitation, like the opening where the regurgitation is. And we're going to talk about vena contracta. That's this right here. And vena contracta is the point in which the valve, like where the diameter of the valve is the smallest and the blood velocity is going to be the highest because the blood has to travel there really fast because it's really tiny the space. Then we have regurgitant orifice area or effective regurgitant orifice area. Um, that's uh, around right here sometimes. And that is simply saying it's the narrowest area of where the actual flow is happening. So what we measure is what we call PISA. And that's what this is. We measure from here to here. And that is the proximal isovelocity surface area a PISA of, the, of a regurgitant um, jet. But we get that with color flow Doppler. So we use it to estimate valvular insufficiency. And it's based on the actual hemodynamics um, of flow through like a small circular orifice. It's not quite circular, but the math behind PISA assumes that the flow is. So let's talk some more about regurgitation. Regurgitation will always have an impact on how the heart-like um, chambers are. So it's going to 
kind of change the shape, which we call cardiac remodeling. It's going to change the chamber size, the shape, and how thick that wall is. If we have chronic regurgitation, sometimes we can have preserved ventricular function, meaning that our ventricles are still working, even though the person has chronic regurgitation. So we're going to have a volume overload pattern, which will lead to the chamber dilating because extra blood is coming back into the chamber. Remember the blood that leaves with regurgitation, some of it returns back to the chamber that it just came from. So what the chamber that is receiving the extra blood is gonna do, it's gonna dilate and get bigger, not thicker, it's just gonna get bigger to accommodate for the increased volume without increasing the pressure. The trouble is this only works for a little while before the heart starts having other problems. Now, if you have acute severe regurgitation, you're going to have a large regurgitant orifice and the a cavity is not going to be able to hold that because it came out of nowhere. So we don't just do TTE, which is what we normally do. You can do a transesophageal echo, cardiac MRI or CT, just so the doctor can make sure that they're giving an accurate and a good strong diagnosis. So this is a short Edelman video on regurgitation. I'd want for you to watch the whole thing, but I'm not going to play all of it for you. I just want you to see how the regurgitation looks in echo. In this peristernal long axis of the left ventricle, the depth has been decreased in order to get a closer look at the ascending aorta and aortic valve leaflets. Seen within the aortic root, just above the aortic leaflets, or flaps typical of aortic dissection. Two flaps seen in this view often mean that there is a circumferential dissection. Another example of an aortic dissection, the proximal ascending aorta shown from the apical four chamber view is some superior angulation. In the 2D image on the left, you can visualize a discrete flap seen above the level of the aortic valve leaflets. On the image on the right, the color flow Doppler, you can see severe aortic regurgitation, not at the aortic valve. In this transesophageal at the top, as seen from the apical long axis view. This is mild and aortic and regurgitation. Length, this regurgitant jet is relatively small which is why this would be classified as mild regurgitation. So as you can see so here, they have aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitation. This is CLAX, the first view we get in echo. Along with a trivial or mild amount of mitral regurgitation.